Justin Bosick has earned his master's degree in the School of Psychology and his doctorate with an emphasis in clinical neuropsychology from Ball State University. He went on to complete his internship and residencies at the Center for Neurological and Neurodevelopmental Health in Gibbsboro, New Jersey, and in Trinity Health Hospitals in Minot, North Dakota. These experiences focused on neurodevelopmental disorders, acquired brain injuries, and psychiatric illnesses in children, adolescents, and adults. Dr. Bosek is a licensed psychologist, a board-certified pediatric neuropsychologist, certified in brain injury specialist, and a national certified school psychologist. He works clinically at Benson and Associates here in Fargo, North Dakota. His clinical work emphasizes on the areas of neurodevelopment, acquired and psychiatric disorders, including fetal alcohol syndrome, brain injury, autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, learning disorders, mood and behavioral dysregulation disorders. Mm -hmm. In addition to his clinical work, Dr. Bosick is the executive director of a nonprofit organization uh, FASND, which focuses on raising awareness for fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. And he is also an adjunct professor in psychology department at North Dakota State University. So without further ado, I'll let Dr. Bosek go ahead and do his presentation today. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jen. And we are going to be reviewing the types of brain injury, um, identifying the prevalence and effects of brain injury and describing treatment approaches um, for brain injury. <clears throat> so first we're going to describe the different types of brain injury. Um, there are many different types of brain injury. Uh, oftentimes we hear, um, hear about concussions and traumatic brain injuries, but these are all under the umbrella of a acquired brain injury. So um, there are non-traumatic brain injuries. These can include uh, uh, anoxia, which is a lack of oxygen, um, especially at birth. So when children are born, uh, we may have heard of the term uh, blue baby. If they're without oxygen for say seven to eight minutes, um, their brains aren't getting the oxygen that they need. And so that can cause um, um, a brain injury. Uh, other non-traumatic brain injuries include infections, um, strokes, tremors, um, tremors after seizures, um, tonic clonic types of seizures where there's a lot of tremors and um, a lot of um, um, a lot of movement that can be quite quite dramatic, which could cause a cause a a brain injury if the, if the head is involved, as well as well as metabolic disorders. Now, there's a couple types of traumatic brain injury. <clears throat> there's an open brain injury. Um, these are penetrating injuries, so it actually penetrates the skull, whereas a non-traumatic brain injury wouldn't be penetrating the skull. Um, Types of open brain injuries, uh, uh, the most common are assaults, falls, um, abuse, um, surgery that may have gone bad. Um, hopefully we, uh, we feel like these uh, don't occur nearly as, um, as often as, as we hope. Um, and then there's closed brain injury. Um, so there may be things like internal pressure that's going on. We, uh, like hydrocephalus when there's too much cerebral sp spinal fluid going on um, and it's pressing on the brain um, and shearing. Shearing is when um, neurons are being, uh, the connections between neurons are being pulled apart. We'll talk more about this in, in, in a few slides. Um, other types of closed brain injuries include um, they can come from assaults, just like open brain injuries, falls, uh, abuse, and accidents, especially car accidents. Um, and let's talk about acquired brain injury because in the last slide, like I said, um, these all fall under the umbrella of an acquired brain injury. Acquired brain injury is an injury to the brain that has occurred after birth, after birth, and it's not hereditary, congenital, or degenerative. Um, the injury commonly results in a change in um, the way the brain functions, obviously. Um, brain cells, the way the brain cells function. 
It can affect um, the physical integrity of the neurons and the connections between the neurons, um, the meta metabolic activity, so the, um, the, the activity, the um, communications that occur, the communication that's occurring between neurons, as well as functional ability. Um, acquired brain injury does not refer to brain injuries induced by birth trauma, though. A traumatic brain injury is an insult to the brain. Um, it's not of a degenerative or congenital nature. Uh, it's caused by an external force. It may produce, um, oftentimes produced a, produces a diminished or altered state of consciousness. Um, most of the time there's a loss of consciousness. We'll get to that in a couple slides here. Um, it can also result in impairment in cognitive abilities, physical functioning. Um, a disturbance of behavioral, emotional functioning, and these effects from a traumatic brain injury could be either temporary or permanent and cause partial or total functional uh, disability in, in many different types of um, uh, functioning. Types of brain injury, uh, traumatic brain injury include uh, tumors, tumors, uh, blood clots, strokes, seizures, um, toxic exposure, uh, substance abuse, um, uh, too much lead exposure, inhalants, once again, substance abuse, um, and different types of different uh, uh, toxic substances that could lead to a, to a traumatic brain injury, as well as infections. Uh, I just talked about this. Um, infections include, uh, but are not limited to, encephalitis, uh, meningitis. Um, these are infections that can um, lead to, um, like I said in the last slide, um, uh, a change in brain functioning, cognitive functioning, physical functioning, ability to complete activities of daily living. Um, there's also metabolic disorders that are tra considered traumatic brain in injuries, like insulin shock, uh, diabetic coma, um, different types of diseases like liver and kidney disease. There's neurotoxic poisoning, um, an airway obstruction, strangulation. So once again, in a, like an anoxic episode um, coming from neurotoxic poisoning where um, the brain isn't getting enough oxygen. So when the brain isn't getting enough oxygen, then uh, it's leading to um, uh, traumatic brain injury. Um, historically speaking, there's three types of, of uh, brain injury. <clears throat> there's mild, moderate, and severe. Mild, uh, we largely consider when there's a, lo a loss of consciousness of less than 30 minutes. However, um, you can have a brain injury, a traumatic brain injury, that doesn't require a loss of consciousness. Um, and there's also something called the Glasgow Coma Scale. Um, so this is a scale that um, uh, has quite a few different ways that we um, uh, that we measure the brain injury and um, scores between 13 to 15 would be considered in the mild range. Uh, moderate brain injuries are when we have a loss of consciousness uh, between 30 minutes to 24 hours. <clears throat> uh, Glasgow coma scales for a moderate brain injury are between 9 and 12. And then severe brain injuries are um, when we have a Glasgow coma scale of less than nine. So, um, and a loss of consciousness of, of over 24 hours. Um, these are severe, like I said, so they could lead to death, um, significant neuropsychological, neurological, neuropsychiatric deficits, um, chronic physical uh, disabilities and neuropsychiatric disabilities. Um, so brain injuries are on a spectrum. Estimates of injury severity, most brain injuries are mild. So about 80% of brain injuries are mild. Um, uh, about 15% are in that moderate range. We'll talk about the moderate range here. <clears throat> There's a lot of different information about what moderate um, brain injuries are. And then uh, very seldomly do we have severe brain injuries uh, well, that's uh, about three to four percent are considered severe brain injuries when we have a loss of consciousness between um, over 24 hours on the Glasgow coma scale 
of less than nine. So a person who's um, lost consciousness and has um, a lot of traumatic um, brain functioning difficulties, physical disabilities occurring from their uh, injury. Something that's a little bit more new that we may not uh, discuss quite as much. Like I said before, we talked a lot about traumatic brain injury um, and concussions. We also have to talk about and think about post-concussion syndromes. It's post-concussion post syndrome. It's estimated that about 10% of individuals with head injuries uh, with a head injury are going to have persistent symptoms. So um, these are problems in uh, uh, cognitive abilities, attention, memory, um, fatigue. I see a lot of fatigue, especially in children, sleep disturbances, either sleeping too much, not being able to stay asleep, uh, a lot of headaches, um, dizziness, irritability, changes in mood and personality. Um, uh, the most, the most uh, prevalent types of um, persistent symptoms are, are usually somatic. So things like headaches, we see a lot of headaches um, in, in children who have post-concussion syndrome, but we also see a lot of um, sleep disturbances, things like fatigue, um, sleeping too much, um, unable to um, stay in school for a full day. Um, so there's a lot of um, accommodations that we need to make for post-concussion syndrome. There's also something called second impact syndrome. So second impact syndrome. This can occur when, uh, when an individual sustains a second injury. So they have a brain injury and then days, minutes, weeks after the initial injury, they have another head injury. Um, these are severe, they're very infrequent and they're becoming more infrequent because of the uh, better media exposure and um, the better care that we're getting for brain injuries. Um, we're trying to stay away from second impact syndrome because uh, second impact syndrome having a second brain injury after the first can be fatal, can result in severe disability and there can be long-term neurological, neuropsychological, and or psychiatric consequences because the brain hasn't fully healed from the, uh, the initial injury. And then there's chronic traumatic encephalopathy. This has gotten quite a bit more press lately. This is um, when we have repeated head injuries. Um, it's a progressive degenerative uh, disease. Um, Individuals with chronic traumatic encephalopathy may show symptoms of dementia or memory loss, aggression, confu confusion, depression. Um, uh, some of the um, media exposure has been surrounding things like uh, uh, football. There's been some football players who've had chronic traumatic encephalopathy where they, they sustain a lot of brain injuries. NFL players are constantly sustaining brain injuries. Um, like I said, a brain injury doesn't require a loss of consciousness, um, but when a, a football player um, hits their head pretty hard and um, doesn't want to come out of the game and just stays in the game, and this happens repeatedly, um, it, can, um, it can lead to a lot of very bad things. Um, there's even been, um, in, in the media, there's been uh, um, talk about people with chronic traumatic encephalopathy committing suicide because their um, their memory has has really faded, their personality has really faded, and um, they've almost become a completely different person. So it's uh, it's a very very serious um, neuro uh, degenerative disease. So now that we've talked about the types of brain injury, let's talk about prevalence, uh, prevalence of brain injury. Um, prevalence of brain injury, the, the most brain injuries that we see, um, as you can see, per 100,000, we see about 1,100 children with brain injuries between the ages of uh, zero and four. I'm going to talk about that in the next slide, why, why that might be. And then um, we see another spike for um, children, adolescents who are 15 to 19, and then over 75. Um, 
Traumatic brain injury is a leading cause of death and acquired disability in, in the United States. According to the CDC, the two age groups, two age groups at greatest risk for TBI are children age zero to four, uh, zero to four. Having a, a one-year-old myself constantly falling, they're learning how to walk. So uh, we see a lot of falls. Um, there's also shaken baby syndrome, um, a very uh, serious condition in which uh, a child is, is shaken and there's this coup counter coup effect where there's severe brain injury. Um, so we see a lot of um, uh, TBIs in, in children zero to four. And then, uh, like I'm saying, uh, there's another uh, spike right around 15 to 19. When kids are more involved in sports, high level sports, they're sustaining concussions, uh, brain injuries. There's more falls as well and motor vehicle crashes. Kids are getting their licenses and um, sustaining more brain injuries. But then there's also a spike here, not quite as high for um, folks over the age of 75, um, usually because of falls, um, because of motor or motor impairments, physical, um, physical difficulties. So there's also falls there. Um, so an estimated 10 million Americans are affected by acquired, acquired brain injury per year. Um, acquired brain injury is the second most prevalent injury and disability in the United States um, behind things like uh, cancer, um, depression, actually, and the effects of depression. Um, but it's the second most prevalent injury and um, cause of disability in the United States. And um, every 23 seconds, one person in the United States sustains a traumatic brain injury. So let's talk about the effects of brain injury, effects of brain injury. I really wanna focus on effects of brain injury and treatment approaches of brain injury. Um, so let's talk about these. Um, when we talk about children, um, Oftentimes I hear that um, if a person's going to have a brain injury, the best time to have that um, uh, head injury, head impact, brain injury is when you're young because your brain, it, the brain is neuroplastic. Your brain is changing until the day that you die. Um, but a brain injury early in life is also very serious. Um, and uh, if you're going to have a brain injury, um, having a brain injury early in life is not necessarily the best time because um, children who are younger are more vulnerable to injuries and um, the effects of a brain injury early in life may not be recognized until later in life because if a child is, say, learning to walk, um, there's a reason that humans ha have eyes that um, are in the front of our heads because we're usually moving forward. So um, the part of our brain that's usually affected by brain injury is the frontal lobe, frontal lobe being responsible for executive functioning. Um, attention, focused attention, sustained attention, impulsivity, inhibition, organization, planning. Um, so if a child is say three years old, has a traumatic brain injury, acquired brain injury to the frontal lobe um, and uh, executive functioning is uh, affected, we may not notice the effects until executive functioning skills are being called into action. Um, say in uh, third grade, when um, children are in six, seven classes and they have to organize all those classes. And that's a very difficult thing for them. Um, that may be because of that injury that they sustained at an early age that occurred to their, um, to their frontal lobes. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about he, uh, typical um, brain development here and typical development in children. Um, I, I, don't, I don't wanna spend too much time on these slides, um, but um, we need to know a little bit about typical brain, brain development, typical development in children and how TBIs can affect, acquired brain injuries can affect some of these things that uh, occur for um, typical development in children. So from birth to three, um, we get a lot of children 
children are acquiring language. Um, their sensory and motor systems are um, being developed, obviously. Um, they're starting to walk. They're starting to um, pick things up on their own, eat on their own, that kind of thing. Um, they start to develop relationships with um, peers, if you want to call them, call them peers, um, other young children. And um, if they have a brain injury during this time, um, things that we could see are much more impulsivity, um, much more primitive behavior, uh, primitive behavior like biting, more hitting, more emotional dysregulation, a lack of self-awareness, um, a lack of responsiveness to others. Um, I, 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 um, I want to say this uh, once again, this is in the behaviors after a TBI in these young children are largely because of um, potential frontal lobe functioning difficulties because all of these things that I'm mentioning uh, that occur after TBI in young children are executive functions. Um, behavioral emotional regulation, lack of self-awareness, inability to uh, self-regulate and lack of responsiveness to others. So um, all of those things can be um, affected during the, the really young years. In preschool, um, we start to uh, learn cause and effect relationships. Um, we develop the ability to think before acting. So inhibition, impulsivity. Um, we focus on one aspect of a situation at a time and uh, emotional focus is on control and mastery. So we're starting to have more um, regulation over our, over our emotions. And we also have more concrete and rigid thinking. So kind of not kind of instead of seeing the forest for the trees, we're still kind of focusing on the trees. However, after an acquired brain injury or brain injury during this time, we may see once again a lot of executive functioning difficulties, um, high emotionality difficulties with um, emotional behavioral dysregulation, impulsivity, lack of inhibition, once again, primitive behaviors, regression, more biting, hitting. Um, a lack of concern for others and um, uh, a resistance to um, basically not following the rules. <clears throat> In the elementary years, like I was saying earlier, um, if we have an, a brain injury during this time, um, there's gonna be uh, uh, children from six to 12 have, uh, they start to really understand cause and effect relationships they are learning a lot of academic skills. Um, they're focusing on uh, effort, effort as being very important, putting in your best effort and recognizing the intention of acts as, as important, recognizing that um, what they do, what they say is, um, is, is impacting their, their behavior, impacting others around them. If they have a brain injury during this time, there can be disruptions in academic skills poor performance, despite hard work, um, so learning disabilities, um, school failure, school avoidance, um, sleep disturbance, once again, um, difficulties falling asleep, sleeping too much, fatigue, um, waking during the middle of, uh, of the night. We can even see more depression, um, social isolation and withdrawal from peers um, because we're having a hard time uh, keeping up with peers. Um, the frontal lobes are also responsible for um, um, social comprehension, social uh, understanding, because the social communication, social interaction requires a, a large part of the, of the brain, different parts of the brain, and um, the frontal lobes are kind of like the orchestrator of the band. So um, there could be withdrawal from peers because we're having a hard time with um, regulating our social skills with our peers. 12 to 16 year olds, um, this is early adolescence, so um, we're understanding uh, uh, multi-step directions, abstract reasoning, kind of thinking outside the box, seeing the forest for the trees, um, becoming more autonomous, um, hopefully, uh, as parents start to kind of give them more responsibility, <clears throat> kind of becoming, um, understanding of, uh, more about who they are. Um, and becoming more responsible. 
Um, but after a brain injury, um, we may see, uh, I say, uh, unevenness in cognitive profiles. So kind of depending on um, the injury, whether it was to um, different parts of the brain, see if it was, um, uh, if the brain injury was uh, occurred to the language parts of the brain, then um, there may be um, difficulties with expressive language, receptive language, whereas visual spatial abilities, usually right hemisphere types of, ab uh, of abilities, charts, maps, graphs, directions, that kind of stuff, um, things that are visual spatial may actually still be intact. So we see kind of an unevenness in their, their cognitive profile. We also may see uh, new learning deficits, new uh, learning disorders that, that haven't been present until that time. Um, they, be, they become potentially, um, the processing speed may slow down. Um, they have more difficulty with executive function, um, difficulty with organization, judgment and reasoning, um, behavioral dis dysregulation, especially um, depression and uh, fatigue. In late adolescence, 16 to 19 year olds, we, we really start to see the forest for the trees. Um, we're able to understand executive functioning, um, at least understand, maybe not always put it into pers perspective. Um, and we will start, we're starting to become um, uh, altruistic and um, um, understanding ourselves to, to, uh, to a much greater degree. So if we have a brain injury during this time of late, late adolescence, um, once again, there may be new learning deficits, reading, math, um, mental processing speed deficits, processing speed deficits usually, uh, a lot of times I call this sluggish cognitive tempo. So a, a person has more difficulty organizing um, cognitive information and being able to express that. Um, uh, receive that and express that in a, in a quick and efficient manner. Um, social awkwardness, um, like I said before, uh, social communication, social interaction is a very um, uh, complex, complex, uh, complex thing. And so we may see some social skills deficits. And then um, once again, um, emotional behavioral dysregulation. And so uh, we see a lot of depression um, in, in all of these, um, uh, all these uh, golden years of, of development in children. Plus, we also see um, from uh, late adolescence more body image and social image uh, concerns, which are very prevalent um, these days, even without a brain injury. But these become, can become even more, <clears throat> more significant. So finally, now that we've talked about types of brain injuries, um, effects of brain injuries, let's talk about treatment approaches. Um, the human brain is neuroplastic, like I said before, neuroplastic plastic. So that means that we are forming new connections in the brain and the brain is changing until the day that we die. Until the 1970s, it was commonly thought that the nervous system was essentially fixed. So um, what you see is what you get, and the brain isn't going to change. Um, in 1998, Fred Gage and Peter Erickson put this, <clears throat> put this thought to bed. Um, so there's different types of plasticity here. Um, neuroplasticity is the brain's ability to rewire itself and alter brain tissue um, neurons for the, for the purpose of adapting to changes externally or internally. So even though we may have some of these effects of brain injury, the, the brain is able to compensate, um, especially if we have um, some of these treatment approaches that I'm going to be talking about um, already, um, we're putting those into our arsenal and learning new ways of being able to um, interact with our environment after our brain injuries, then there's going to be a lot more plasticity that occurs. <clears throat> Treatment approaches, um, it's a team approach. So um, if, if, if a person has a, a child has an acquired brain injury, um, we need to contact our primary care physician to make sure that they know that there may be some changes that are going on 
Um, obviously, as a neuropsychologist, um, I think that neuropsychological assessment after brain injury is very important so that we can um, look at things like potential um, attention, memory, difficulties, um, um, unevenness, like I was talking about before, uneven, unevenness and cognitive profiles. Um, if we're able to do that, then we're able to make um, accommodations for people who have unevenness and in, in cognitive profiles, psychologists, therapists to help us, mental health therapists to help us um, almost deal with this, uh, this new change in, um, in the way that we are functioning after a brain injury. Neuropsychiatry, um, medication management may be unnecessary. And there's also rehabilitation specialists. I was in neuro rehabilitation for uh, about a year and there's a lot of different um, ways that we can go about helping <clears throat> people with brain injury um, um, learn new ways to, to navigate their environment based upon their brain injury. Um, this could include occupational therapists who help us with activities of daily living, speech therapists, especially if the language areas of the brain were affected, and physical therapists if, if the brain injury was potentially a little bit more moderate to severe and there was some physical therapy um, needs, um, then, then that would be necessary. There's also school accommodations. You know, we're talking about kids here. So school accommodations as a nationally certified school psychologist, this is a big part of what I do when I work with brain, uh, children with brain injuries. So we'll talk about those in just a minute. And um, the team approach also needs to include um, family education. This is, this is a big one because everyone needs to be able to understand um, uh, the brain injury, what happened to um, the person who sustained the brain injury and ways to be able to help them. So medical management <clears throat> after a brain injury, um, formal imaging, imaging um, CT scans, MRIs uh, may be necessary. There may be vestibular disorders, so um, inner ear disorders that cause um, balance difficulties. Um, and then uh, medical management, like I'm saying before, uh, neuropsychological testing to uh, document symptoms, um, put numbers to symptoms. And neuropsychologists like myself, we um, do very extensive testing um, to get a whole bunch of numbers. And then we see these children, these people with brain injuries um, on a, what we call a serial um, neuropsychological testing table protocol every year to make sure that um, their, their, uh, their, their functioning is improving. So um, a little bit biased there, but neuropsychological testing is, I, I believe, very important. Medical management may also include uh, cardio, a cardiopulmonary system. So um, once again, uh, some of the more severe types of brain injury um, uh, may affect the, the heart, um, especially if the midbrain is affected. Um, the respiratory uh, system um, and some of these more severe brain injuries, the um, larynx and trachea could be involved, um, leading to language difficulties. <clears throat> the muscul muscul musculoskeletal system, which could create spasticity, so uh, rigidness in individuals who've uh, sustained brain injury, spasticity, so uh, we may need um, therapists on our side, uh, physical therapists, especially to help us with that. Skin systems may be uh, impacted after brain injury, things like lacerations, abrasions, uh, ulcers, gastrointestinal si uh, systems may be impacted, actually may see an increase in metabolism, uh, poor coordination and dysphagia, so difficulty with swallowing, these things all need to be managed, very important. Um, to manage all these diff uh, different things. And then neurolog uh, neurological systems as well. And I was talking about um, uh, headaches before as being one of the uh, most highly and widely recognized um, areas of um, um, areas that, that we see as being um, impacted by brain injury, especially in younger kids. So psychosomatic symptoms, as well as seizures, because seizures um, occur much, much more frequently 
um, relatively speaking, in individuals who have um, uh, brain injuries than those who do not. <clears throat> I don't want to pound on this too hard, but um, as a neuropsychologist, I think neuropsychological evaluations are very important. So in neuropsychology, we assess um, a lot of things, overall cognitive functioning to look at, um, um, like I said, an unevenness in, in um, cognitive profiles. We call this um, potential splinter skills. So people may have um, uh, better visual spatial skills and language skills, depending on which part of the brain was more impacted, even though we all know that um, um, the whole brain is responsible for behavior and um, certain parts of the brain can compensate if one part of the brain was impacted and, and another part of the brain wasn't. Um, but neuropsychological evaluations also look for um, difficulties with attention, memory, executive functioning, organization planning, um, especially um, in, in children who are a little bit older where um, organization and planning are <clears throat> much more important, especially in these days when um, there's a lot of um, testing that goes on and children are being asked to manage um, more classes and a higher class load and um, meet um, state standardized testing, that kind of thing. Um, that can become a, a big problem for people, uh, children with brain injuries. Um, neuropsychological evaluations, when we're working with um, children, we're also working with their families. So um, we, can, we can assess adaptive skills. And when we do that, and then make recommendations and suggest treatment planning based, based upon these neuropsychological evaluations, um, we can look at strengths and weaknesses in the, the individual's uh, neuropsychological profile and help with things like attention, memory, executive functioning, language abilities, visual spatial abilities, and abilities to complete activities of daily living. So uh, like I said, neuropsychological, neuropsychological evaluations are very extensive and we look at a lot of different things and document uh, all of these different areas of functioning over time um, and make recommendations to make sure that uh, these these things are, are improving and there's progress in all these different areas. Um, psychiatric management may also be necessary. Um, psychiatric manifestations may, may occur after brain injury. We were talking before about a lot of fatigue. Fatigue um, a lot of times is uh, one of the, the soft signs of depression. So there may, there's a lot of change that occurs after a brain injury in a person's functioning. So um, when a person sustains a brain injury, they have to almost, um, it's almost like they're a new person, if, if, especially if the brain injury was a, a little bit more severe. <clears throat> so they may have a hard time dealing with this. Um, it may lead to more depression or anxiety, even uh, bipolar disorder, psychoses, um, schizophrenia, schizophrenia-like symptomology, um, and anxiety disorders. Yeah panic attacks, phobias, obsessive compulsiveness. Um, a lot of these psychiatric manifestations may occur after brain injury and um, psychiatric man management may be necessary. <clears throat> I mentioned this before, but, um, but therapies are very important based upon um, a child's uh, neuropsychological profile. Um, so speech therapy may be necessary if a person is, if a child is struggling with receptive and expressive language, um, cognitive therapy. Um, if a child is struggling with executive functioning, organization, planning, attention, that kind of thing, there are um, therapists that provide those types of therapies. They focus on um, helping children navigate their environment um, cognitively. Um, occupational therapy, helping children um, complete activities of daily living, among other things. There's even occupational therapists who uh, focus on behavioral and emotional regulation and then physical therapy. Um, if um, children are struggling with <clears throat> coordination, movement, that kind of thing after brain injury. And then um, uh, mental health therapy and uh, family therapy is very important as well as we're, we're moving through um, almost a new stage of life after a brain injury. I have a lot of school accommodations 
like I said before, I'm a nationally certified school psychologist. So um, um, when I'm working with children, um, their full-time job is to, is to go to school. Um, so an IEP, Individualized Education Plan, may be necessary, or a 504 plan. These are plans that are put into place to help children um, uh, get accommodations based upon their needs, uh, based upon their motor uh, needs, physical uh, needs. There may be feeding disorders, sensory impairments, communication impairments um, that, they, that need to be accommodated for in an IEP or 504 plan. Um, uh, generally speaking, IEPs are much more um, comprehensive individualized education plans and they're legally binding documents, so they're much more extensive. 504 plans are a little less extensive, so if, if uh, a brain injury has caused a lot of um, um, impairments in many diff different uh, functions, uh, cognitively learning uh, difficulty and um, behavioral dysregulation, emotional dysregulation, um, motor impairments, physical uh, effects. Um, we definitely want to push for an IEP as, a, as opposed to a 504 plan. Some of the school accommodations that I, that I make a lot, um, we have to account for fatigue. So after a child sustains a brain injury, we certainly can't uh, many times send them right back to school for eight hours a day because they get cognitively fatigued um, and they may need to, to go back to, to school, say part-time, you know, half time and um, just build up slowly. There may be medical issues that need to be addressed, um, social, emotional or behavioral difficulties that need to be addressed. Things like functional behavioral assessment plans, where we're looking at the things leading up to at the antecedents of behaviors, the behaviors, and then the consequences of those behaviors and a positive behavioral support or an applied behavior analysis type of sense um, to help children regulate their emotions. Um, there may be family difficulties as well because it, it's hard after a brain injury to um, not only for the person sustaining the injury, but for the family to be able to work with the person that sustained the brain injury that, um, um, that may have almost become this different person. Um, and they, they may need um, a lot of different types of, um, they may have a lot of different, different needs. School accommodations too, as I see older children, as we see older children, um, there may need to be some post-school or vocational issues. Um, IEPs, a lot of times, um, I write recommendations for IEPs and then um, go on, you know, if children go on to college or voca uh, vocational schools, we can also get um, some accommodations put into place there as well. Other school accommodations. Um, so if there's cognitive or learning challenges, we want to address attention difficulties, memory difficulties, executive functioning difficulties, processing speed difficulties, and these splinter skills, this unevenness in cognitive profiles. So, um, so if there's attention and concentration difficulties, we want to um, provide all of these different types of, these are just a few of the different types of accommodations that we want to <clears throat> recommend. Um, providing clear learning objectives, um, providing breaks, um, provide, providing nonverbal attention cues, trying to keep kids on track. Um, if there's memory and learning problems, we want to provide learning objectives for each lesson, um, link new information to relevant prior knowledge, provide hands-on learning opportunities, and um, frequently repeat and summarize information, use organizers. This is where the, um, the um, cognitive therapy comes into place. Uh, whenever I work with children, um, whenever I did therapy with children, I always made sure that they had an organizer, uh, not just like a, like a Google um, um, account where they kept everything on their <clears throat> electronic devices, but an actual paper planner, because that's um, much less, it's much more simple and easier for them to organize, preferably in a written format if they're able to, to do those things. And um, 
it's very important for a person, for a caregiver, for a teacher, for a counselor to be able to help them keep their organizers um, up to date. Um, also, if there's memory and learning problems, kids are going to you know, sometimes forget their books at school, forget their books at home. I know a lot of uh, learning now is done online, but um, if, if we're having hard copies of books, then another um, accommodation is provided an extra set of books for home so that we even if we have these difficulties um, going back and forth, that that's not impacting their ability to learn. Um, school accommodations for organization difficulties. Um, in one of my next slides, I talk about bimodal learning strategies. So, um, so bimodal learning strategies. A lot of times we hear um, people that are uh, visual learners. Whenever I hear that, um, the first thing that comes to mind is that <clears throat> you're you're a visual learner because someone's telling you about the information, so hearing it verbally, that's using one part of your brain. But then you're also seeing it visually, so you're using you're you're learning the information twice. And we know for learning the information twice, we have a much better chance of being able to retain that information. So um, if there's organization difficulties, we also we, we want to make sure that we're uh, providing as much uh, visual opportunities as possible. And that's what a lot of these organization um, accommodations are, are talking about here. Other accommodations following directions. So bimodal learning, bimodal learning. Um, if a person um, has a brain injury, uh, it's usually frontal lobe, it's usually executive functioning, it's usually attention, memory, learning difficulties. So being able to provide oral and written instructions is very important. We call that bimodal learning, um, as well as helping them through um, some of the organization strategies that, that they may need, that they do need in, in, uh, as they become older and as they become um, asked, as they become, when they become asked to do more complex work and when they have more work to do um, this can become difficult for them to organize other school accommodations if there's auditory perceptual uh, difficulties we want to limit the amount of information that we present um, we have to speak more slowly because there may be uh, processing speed difficulties um, i stress this a lot with my bimodal learning strategies we want to um, allow for um, learning opportunities to be um, uh, presented twice because if we learn things twice then we're twice as likely to more than twice as likely to be able to remember that information um, and then also using a buddy system so having a peer be help them uh, repeat instructions because um, uh, i feel like the the school system is um, is really stretched thin so um, using a buddy system is, is, uh, is very helpful as well, can be very helpful. There could be visual uh, perceptual difficulties as well. So we wanna use large print, um, provide, uh, present materials that are on a slant if there's um, visual perceptual difficulties or not on a slant, um, putting um, visual information that's larger and outlining all the visual information, limiting the amount of information on one page, especially if there's a attention difficulties, because if we have attention difficulties and impulsivity, and we um, literally get a uh, math worksheet with 100 problems on it, and we're asked to do it in two minutes. Um, this I've um, heard um, uh, and, uh, literally, <clears throat> that's going to be very difficult for any child, um, especially for children with attention difficulties. So we want to limit the amount of information that we have on one page, um, uh, provide longer viewing times, um, um, provide charts, maps, directions, and visual formats um, so that uh, children are able to learn um, as well as possible. And if there's motor and physical difficulties, then we need to use assistive technology and adaptive uh, devices to provide better, uh, better access. Um, uh, I went to a high school with, with three flights of stairs, didn't have a, 
uh, an elevator. So um, if there's motor and physical difficulties, then we need to uh, provide better access to um, help children get to their classes. Um, very important, especially when we're talking about the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, if there's motor and physical issues, especially with written expression, we need to allow extra time and adapted physical, uh, physical education is also very important. So um, I got through that um, with a little tiny bit of time left. So do we have any questions? Hi, this is Julie Hatfield. Um, I have a client that's got a brain injury that I'm going to be working with. And I'm wondering if there's any resources that I can access to help the school, you know, because we live in a small community, to help them get more on board with the accommodations that he's likely going to need. Yeah. Any yeah. Resources? Is there an IEP or is there a 504 plan? Um, he's not back yet, but he will be coming back. And so that's going to be looked at when he comes back. Okay. Okay. Um, that's very important to do that. Yes. <laughs> um, and yeah, he's going to need all of these different interventions that you had said on there. Um, the part is if the school's not worked with brain injuries very much and it's a smaller school, mm -hmm. I'm just, I want to be able to have references for them so that they can believe me easier. Does that make sense? Yes. Absolutely. Um, use these slides. There's also, um, I certainly didn't copyright them, <laughs> um, but there's also really great books out there. I wish I would have brought, I wish I would have brought, um, there's a book on school accommodations for um, children with, um, um, with acquired brain injuries. And then, uh, not sure if I. What's it called a brain injury network? Yes. And uh, there are some Thank resources you. in there with toolkits and techniques that you can use for school, for students, uh, families to go ahead and it's a wealth of information, one site, um, and there's resources in there if you need somebody to help with the school to perhaps tap them to be an advocate on that 504 team or IEP team so they could help to creatively work on the particular skills or skills deficits that have now resulted as a part of the brain injury. Yep, good. Um, North Dakota Brain Injury, um, and they they hold a lot of meetings. They're awesome. Like Dr. Kumar. Um, and then Dr. there's the Dr. North, North. Sorry, Doctor Kumar. Yes, I have a question, but I will let you finish first. Um, I was going to say, oh, the North Dakota um, Protection and Advocacy Center. Yep, that's a big one too. But I think I, I think recently I heard that you have to have an IEP already to be able yeah. to qualify to to access their services. But, um, having an advocate on your side is very important, especially when you're in a smaller school. Dr. Kumar, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yes, so um, as a pediatrician, how soon uh, should we initiate the testing after the acute event? Like we, I do admit cases and then what is the frequency? And we have like intense difficulty getting it done because I think one or two that who are doing this in Bismarck have left or don't have any openings. So, and what is the age, minimum age you can do the testing for brain injury and is that, that protocol? Thank you. I see kids from, uh, if it's brain injury, um, I'm seeing a three-year-old coming up here in March. But honestly speaking, I have a lot of flexibility here at my clinic. Um, so, if you want to send me a kid or if you want to send me a 30 year old, I've, I've worked with adults before. Um, and Can I it be done telemedicine wise or you have to do it in person? I'm sorry? Can it be done like a telemedicine or it has to be in person? The assessment is done in person. I have to do, we, we do an interview. Um, so I would do a Zoom interview. Yep. So I know you said Bismarck, right? Yeah. Yep. So Bismarck. So I would do a Zoom interview and we would talk. Uh, I would talk with the parents about a lot of this stuff. And then um, the actual assessment would be done. Um, we're just working on being able to do assessments um, via tele. Uh, I, I just don't trust it. I, I need to see the person. I need to see the child in person um, to be able to do this kind of testing. And um, 
and make observations. And the first part of the question, like suppose this is like a uh, traffic accident and head injury, and I am discharging him today. You know, then yes. when I actually have an actual patient like that. So what is the appropriate timing for testing? Because things are really not good at, his brain is not okay at this time, you know, so, he's, so what is the best time to start this? Um, the rule of thumb, I, I usually say six to nine months after the injury to do testing. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, um, because there's going to be a, a lot of spontaneous regeneration that occurs be, in those first six to nine months. So, um, uh, a lot of times, um, if we do it too early, um, it's almost like an invalid test because six months later, it's going to be a completely different kid. Um, so I, I usually, I, I, I like to wait six months. I would like to wait not nine months. In the meantime, for discharge planning, would you have other remedies or other therapies that you would like to or recommend having in place upon the discharge plan from a hospital? Um, perhaps they're not ready for neuropsychological testing, but having whatever particular therapies may be needed, if it's occupational, speech, um, depends on the type of injury sustained, I suppose. Absolutely. 